Greetings from uh, Mount Calvary in Manselden and uh, St. Thomas is of, uh, over in St. Thomas. Uh, it's good to be back uh, with you this morning. Um, the way to heaven. The way to heaven. You know, people are, are really funny, aren't they? Um, I think I'm seeing them much funnier the older I get as you perhaps take more notice of them and uh, of the things that uh, they say and do. Um, I remember some months back coming into the crematorium at the end of a humanist funeral. And uh, now most humanist funerals cover the cross at the front, remove all references to God or the afterlife or prayer, and the more hard-bitten of them will even forbid the playing of an organ because of its religious overtones. So they will have something played across the system. But at this particular funeral, as the mourners left, wafting over the heads of the departing people were the unmistakable uh, voice of Vera Lynn singing, we'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when. And I just wonder if our humanist friend at the front kind of spotted the irony of that. You know, we meet again. How? If there's no afterlife, there's nothing else there, how on earth can we meet again? And I like to think that maybe, maybe this song choice was some kind of a subliminal expression of a hope in an afterlife that was chosen by the people, not just because of the associations with World War II, but because it said something deep and uh, unmistakable to their hearts, to their longings. You know, in the vast majority of funerals I, I'm involved in, and there's a lot of funerals, it seems to me, um, there's always a flicking hope in, expressed in some way, some throwaway phrase or other, or even a choice of, of, a, of a poem or whatever, that seems to express this, this longing for something more. That the person has died, has not gone completely, but they are still there somewhere, and they will meet again. Don't know where, don't know when. And even the most convinced atheist, whose faith, and it is a faith, whose faith tells them that there is no heaven, I like to think there's an unspoken wish that it might, might just be true. Now as Christians, we shouldn't be the least surprised by this. Solomon, that wise king from 3,000 years ago, once said that God has set eternity in the heart of man. And if we can't express it, he's saying, there's this longing in us all for somewhere called home. Not here, but after. And C.S. Lewis once wrote that this longing is, in, is, is itself a strong evidence of there being an afterlife. Why long for something that you can't have? It's like being hungry, uh, proving the existence of food. You don't get hungry unless, of course, there's food to eat. And so C.S. Lewis once wrote, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Why long for something that doesn't exist? God has put eternity in the heart of man. Now given then that we all have this inbuilt yearning for home or heaven, the question I want to ask is the one that was put on the newsletter, and that is, how do we get there? How do we get to heaven? What is the way? Well, in previous ages, uh, we all had the Bible to go to to answer that question, and a lot of other important questions of life. But today, most people look for other guides, and even think they can get there by their own steam. I read the story of a mischievous little boy who was once asked by his mother how, given all the naughty things he continued to do, how did he expect to get into heaven? And he thought for a moment, he said this, well, I shall just run in and out and keep slamming the door until they say, for goodness sake, either come in or stay out. And I'll stay in. <laughs> As the story illustrates, Lots of people have their own ideas of how to get into heaven. And some also turn, of course, to the other religions which mix in to the society in which we now live in. But what we find with these is a bewildering mix of different and conflicting ideas, which only confuse us. And so the Muslim will tell you that Allah has, set, has a set of weighing scales. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad, then you may gain entry. 
So it's 50-50 or maybe even worse. The Buddhist doesn't really believe in heaven, but he will teach you about nirvana. And he will tell you that it's reached by taking the eightfold path. Right views, intention, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration in that order, the Eightfold Path. However, once Nirvana is attained, you will disappear into nothingness and non-existence. So that's worth looking forward to, isn't it? <laughs> and the Hindu, well, the Hindu believes in reincarnation, the transmigration of the soul from one life form to another. If you live a virtuous life, you'll move up the scale, say from low caste to high caste or the National League to the Premier. But if you live an unworthy life when, I'm afraid, you get relegated, you move down the scale from low caste to, say, a rat or a fly or a cockroach. And then, after many, many, many reincarnations, you'll eventually become absorbed into Brahman, the eternal spirit, which can be either male, female, or maybe even an animal. So there's lots to look forward to under these different systems of talking about the afterlife. But what about Christianity? Well, for the Christian, the way to heaven is neither of these ways. Not through self-effort, but through what God has done in Christ. Not through good works, but good faith. Not reincarnation, but resurrection. Not a set of instructions pointing us towards the way, but knowing the person who is the way himself the Lord Jesus Christ, which brings us to Psalm 23. And we are familiar with this beautiful psalm, but you know, familiarity breeds, doesn't it, a kind of contempt. You can, we can know something so well that we can overlook what it's actually saying, how important it is. And Psalm 23 is a very, is a case in point. And yet it contains such important truths as we search for the answer to the question. It has roughly three parts to it. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The end tells us about heaven. It says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord forever, verse six. And of course, if you've read your New Testament, well, you'll immediately recognize a very similar description in the words of the Lord Jesus in chapter 14 of St. John's Gospel, where he's talking about his approaching death. And he says to the disciples, but they're not to worry about this, because, he says, when he goes, he will go to prepare a place for them in what he calls my Father's house. Notice the house of the Lord, my Father's house. But the significant point that we need to notice when he says this is what he says next. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You notice that relationship he's talking about, the importance of the fact that it is Jesus that will lead us. It is he will come and, and, and take us to where, we, where we're meant to go so that we will be with him. The, notice that relationship. It's so, so important. Notice he doesn't give them a set of instructions or directions, a list of places they need to pass through or tasks to complete in order to get there. He simply says, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. It's like asking a man directions, and instead of telling you, turn right, turn left, go up the hill, and go down the hill, get in a car with you and saying, look, I'll show you the way. But of course, you and I these days would be very wary of letting any strangers in our cars, no matter what they, uh, what they promise. We want to know if their motives were good, if they were trustworthy, or they were of good character. You don't let anybody in your car, just you wouldn't let anybody in your house. And David in his psalm is no different here. If our destination is to be the house of the Lord, then he wants to assure us that the one who leads us there is someone we can trust completely. And so he starts out with this description. And this description, given that the Lord, the role of our guide, I should say, is the most important part of the psalm. Everything is built on that first verse. 
the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. First of all, he calls him Lord. Lord. Now bear in mind that David himself was the king of Israel and everybody else would be calling him Lord. He was the top of the pile. He was the one to whom everybody paid taxes. He's the, it was his laws and his commands that everybody obeyed. And in effect, everything they had belonged to their Lord and he could demand it at any moment. And so they looked up to him and they respected him. But although David is the sovereign over Israel, and he bowed his knee to no man, yet he bowed his knee to one who was greater, and that is the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And he believed that with all his heart, and he confesses it, doesn't he? The Lord is my shepherd, the Lord. But be careful here, because as Jesus reminds us in Matthew's Gospel, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of his Father. Notice, his Father in heaven. Which is why he adds, Jesus adds, many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not in your name drive out demons, perform many miracles? Then, he says, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. There was nothing personal about this at all. There was no relationship of trust. Yes, you call me Lord, but I don't know you. You see, we may well want to acknowledge God as Lord out of a self of, sense of self-preservation. I know, I better call him Lord, you know, scared. As a cowed people, perhaps, would acknowledge a ruthless dictator. Everyone would call him Lord because they have to. David is not speaking about God like that, which is why he goes on and he adds another aspect to this, this God who, who he calls Lord. He calls him a shepherd. Now we know from the Bible that the relationship between a shepherd and his sheep was a very, very close one. Built not on fear, but love and trust. If the shepherd was a good one, then, as Jesus reminds us in John 10, the sheep will know and will trust the shepherd's voice and follow him anywhere. I like a, a, when modern shepherdess wrote this, she said, Sheep are naturally afraid of things they do not know. It's their survival instinct. But once sheep get to know you and trust you, they aren't afraid. They can be affectionate, loving friends that will follow you like a dear old dog. It's all about relationships. It's not about fear. It's about that interaction between the two. And so when David calls God his shepherd, he's painting the same picture of loving loyalty. A sheep feels towards a good and loving shepherd that it knows and trusts. And that's what David is trying to convey us here. It's not just about Lord bowing the knee to one who is greater than I. It is about following him as a sheep follows the shepherd. And that's why we can fully trust, says the psalm, as we go through the middle part of it, we can fully trust God to provide all our needs. I shall not want. And all our needs are represented by this pictural language of green pastures and still waters where our souls, our vitality, our health and well-being is restored. Where he leads us along right paths, he protects us from dark valleys and dangerous times until eventually this good shepherd whom we know and love, who is God and Lord, will lead us to victory over death. We sit down in the presence of our enemies and to the fullness of life, the anointed with oil, the overflowing cup, and to the house of the Lord we will dwell with him forever. A wonderful picture of Lord and shepherd that we can trust to show us the way to heaven. But there's one more aspect. And this is all very theoretical. This is all about descriptions. There is another important word that we miss right in the middle of all of this. When David says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. It's what's called the personal possessive pronoun, my he may well be Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, to whom all honour is due. He may well be the good shepherd who is trustworthy and true. But what use is any of that unless personally I trust this shepherd and can 
refer to him in terms that are relational. My, I know this shepherd. I am convinced. I am convicted. I believe. I believe in him. You know, the great evangelist and, she- and, and, and Christian John Wesley himself had to discover this. He was, uh, as, as a young man, very earnest in his faith. He followed the prayer book, the 6062 prayer book, you know, as closely as possible. He did. He, 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 he prayed it. He worshipped it. He followed the instructions. He believed the articles. He read the homilies. He uh, prayed twice a day. He fasted. He studied the Bible. He went as a missionary to the Native American Indians in Georgia. He obeyed God as his Lord and recognized him as the good shepherd and laid down his life for the sheep. But yet, something was missing. And he writes in his journal, I went to America to convert the Indians, he writes, but oh, who shall convert me? I have a fair summer religion. I can talk well, but let death look me in the face and my spirit is troubled. Alienated as I am from the life of God, I am a child of wrath and of air, an heir of hell. And yet, he was the Lord and shepherd. But later, as he walked one day down Aldersgate Street in Bristol on his way to hear someone preach, all this suddenly changed. As he passed a meeting house, he heard someone reading, reading from Martin Luther's preface to the letter of the Romans. And he says, this is what happened next. Almost a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Personal warmed his heart, touched him. And that night, Wesley tells us he went, and this is important, he went from the faith of a slave to the faith of a son. In other words, for Wesley, God went from being the Lord to my Lord, and from being a shepherd to being my shepherd. And this is the confession of every true Christian. That God is not out there or up there or somewhere But he is here within my life and my heart, working with me every day to bring me to that place called the house of the Lord. He is my shepherd, my Lord. And I think that lovely hymn sometimes sums it up perfectly. The king of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. I can hear it tuning in my head now. If we wish to find the way to heaven, it is only by faith in the one who will take us there and will go with us. The faith of a subject in their king, yes. The faith of a sheep in their shepherd, yes. But also as a child to its father. Can you say this morning, the Lord is my shepherd in that way? Then, if you can, You will have the faith that he will, in the end, lead you to that place called home, the Lord's house, the Father's house, to live with him forever. May God give you that faith.